Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event, which is the latest in this term series of research seminars hosted by the British Centre for Literary Translation at the University of, Ang of East Anglia in Norwich, England. Today's event has a different format from normal, as it will be a roundtable discussion focused on a landmark publication that came out from Routledge just a few months ago, Anthology of Arabic Discourse on Translation. Now, if you attended last week's BCLT seminar with Michael Cooperson, you'll appreciate that today's session establishes a mini Arabic theme to this month's events. Michael Cooperson is indeed one of the translators represented in the new collection, but I'm delighted to say that we are joined today by the anthology's two editors, Miriam Salama Ka and Tarek Shama. And they'll be discussing the volume with Savad Hussein. An award-winning translator from Arabic, Savad, is currently co-chair of the Translators Association here in the UK. Last year, she held a visible communities residency at our partners, the National Center for Writing in Norwich. And since February this year, Savad has been translator in residence at BCLT, together with uh, Laura McLaughlin, from whom we heard just a few weeks ago. So uh, Savad will uh, introduce Miriam and Tarek, and I'll hand over to her in just a moment. But before I do so, let me do a couple of other things. Um, Firstly, by way of housekeeping, I'll remind you that this seminar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the uh, BCLT's YouTube channel shortly. And you can also find their recordings of uh, many of our previous uh, seminars and other BCLT events. Uh, there'll be time for audience questions at uh, later in today's session, so do feel free to put your questions to the panelists using the Q&A function, please. Um, there's a chat button as well, of course, and uh, you're welcome to, uh, uh, to uh, comment in other ways uh, during the discussion uh, in the chat, but uh, the Q&A button for your questions, please, and then you can also see other people's questions and upvote those that you particularly enjoy. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is briefly give you a flavor of Tarek and Miriam's anthology. So I've simply put the contents pages on a number of slides, which I'll share with you now. So I'll quickly take you through the contents of the uh, anthology, which is a particularly rich collection of no fewer than 52 uh, short texts. Um, I'll read to you as well the uh, publisher's summary. This anthology brings the key writings on translation in Arabic in the pre-modern era, uh, extending from the earliest times 6th century CE until the end of World War I to a global English speaking audience. The texts are arranged chronologically and organized by two historical periods, the classical period and the Nahda period or the period of awakening from 1800 onwards. So you'll see there are 26 in the first section, taking us up to the end of the 18th century CE, and then the Nafta period also has a further 26 extracts. Uh, the texts are arranged chronologically and organized by two historical periods. Each text is preceded by an introduction about the selected text and author, placing the work in context and discussing its significance. The texts are complemented with a theoretical commentary discussing the significance for the contemporary period and modern theory. A general introduction covers the historical context, main trends, research interests, and main findings and conclusions. The two appendices provide statistical data of the corpus on which the anthology is based, more than 500 texts of varying lengths extending throughout the entire period of study. This collection contributes to the development of a more inclusive and global history of translation and interpreting. And I'm sure that's one of the areas uh, on which our discussion 
is going to focus. So without uh, further ado then, uh, let me hand over to uh, Savad, who will uh, take things on from here. Savad, welcome. Thank you, Duncan, for that very warm welcome to everybody and to us. And yes, hello, everyone. And and we're so happy to have you here with us today. I'm going to introduce Tariq and Miriam officially, and then we'll start into our discussion. We will have ample time for Q&A, so feel free as we're you know, discussing if anything um, comes to mind you know, while we're covering a specific topic, just talk pop it into the Q&A and we'll get to it in about 50 minutes or so. We're hoping to um, move on to Q&A, give you about half an hour for questions and answers. So we have ample time there. Wonderful. Okay, so Thodik Shama is Associate Professor in Comparative Literature and Translation Studies at Binghamton University, New York. His recent publications include In Search of Universal Laws, Averro's interpretation of Aristotle's poet, poetics in world literature, that's in 2021, and Universal Wisdom, Islamic Law, Translation Discourse in Classical Arabic, in the Rutledge Handbook of Translation History, also from 2021. Welcome, Tariq. We're so glad you could join us. And we also have the distinguished Miriam Salama Carr, who is an honorary research fellow at the University of Manchester, where she's dialing in from today, Center for Translation and Intercultural Studies. She's, she is the author of La Traduction à l'époque Abbasid, 1990, and her publications include Mapping an Arabic Discourse on Translation in the Rutledge Handbook of Arabic Translation 2020, as well as L'École de Baghdad, Equivalence. 2020 as well. Thank you so much, Miriam, for being here today. You feel free uh, for the both of you to unmute yourselves. Actually, please do so we can <laughs> start our discussion. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So I'm, um, I'm just going to start us off to say that in the introduction, uh, it was alluded to that, you know, currently there are Western biases in translation studies. And that was sort of one of the motivations for this anthology. And so I wanted to talk to the both of you about why do we need this anthology? What, what, is, what sort of gap is it addressing in currently like the translation studies field? Okay, shall I uh, start mm -hmm. this? It's, it's, quite, it's quite, quite a question. Um, it, it might be useful to, to start with referring to the, the kind of the grounding of our work and the context in which the uh, anthology uh, took place, you know, from the point of view of translation studies in, in general. Right. I think it's fair to say that translation studies, perhaps over the last 20 years or so, has been um, kind of striving for inclusiveness. So there has been a, a move towards uh, trying to include more voices, uh, more examples of how translation was performed and conceptualized. Um, and, you know, just to mention a few sort of uh, titles, uh, De Lille and Woodsworth in 1995, were the trans translators through history, which was you know, covering uh, quite a you know, wide range of um, spatial temporal uh, areas. Um, Michel Ballard in 1992, you know, a book uh, written in French called From Cicero to Benjamin, but which included quite a, quite a lot of information about the Baghdad school, for instance. So there was some kind of efforts at integration. And of course, the Routledge uh, Encyclopedia of Translation Studies, which has you know, includes a number of, of uh, traditions. So this was a kind of, um, a, you know, positive environment for the sort of work that we, we got involved in. So there was this trend for inclusiveness, but also a much more explicit focus on other traditions. So it wasn't just a question of being inclusive, but it was a question of giving a platform for um, traditions, I mean, uh, non-Western traditions. And here I'm mm. thinking of uh, the, um, Marilyn Gaddis uh, Rose's book, beyond the Western tradition. So it's you know, much more explicit engagement. And Theo Hermann's work on uh, translating others, 
again, more voices from outside of perhaps, you know, your European and Western uh, construct. And um, of course, Martha Schein's seminal um, anthology of text you know, on, on the Chinese tradition. Oh, okay. So the ground, in a sense, I think was being uh, prepared. This in parallel with the awareness among um, certainly um, people working within translation studies or um, literary studies and with access to Arabic, that there was so much material there. And mm. this material was could be found in different places. There was a lot of very interesting work in philology, philological studies, in Islamic Arabic studies, but not within translation studies <coughs> proper. Um, right. So the, this is the sort of, you know, in a sense, perhaps, which helped towards uh, the, the setting up the anthology. Uh, there is another aspect, which um, perhaps, you know, um, Tarek as the kind of lead on, on, the, on the project might be in a better position to, to discuss, but is the, the, the aspect of cultural policies and politics, mm -hmm. which meant that there was support for the project, you know, in, the, in an Arabic, you know, language context as well. Um, I also, I think, they, you know, at a, perhaps a very broad level of the, uh, the discipline of translation studies itself, um, Lieven Delft has spoken of a culture of translation. And there was, you know, certainly a, a, a feeling on our part that by working on an anthology, we were contributing to this culture of translation. Definitely. Um, there was also, I mean, as I mentioned before, this awareness and th th there was the, there was this, this very interesting material there that could, you know, would perfectly fit into an anthology. And so, you know, it's the cultural politics, but it's also the discipline itself, I think, that was m moving in that direction. Um, you have, you know, you refer to the, the sort of the Western bias, I think, I think I like to look at this as perhaps a, a continuum where there, there was perhaps a lack of awareness of this Arabic tradition. Um, in some instances, it's simply a question of access to the to the writings, and you know, if they have not been translated, and if you do not have access to Arabic, you're perhaps unlikely to to think that there is such a wealth of uh, of information. Um, of course, you have the more extreme, um, perhaps, the narratives where the contribution of the um, Arabic speaking world to conceptualizing translation has been minimized or ignored or even seen as simply a question of appropriation. And I think this applies very much to the a medieval period of the classical age of Islam, where you could have extreme, which I call extreme, uh, distorting narratives, which would look at it as simply the Arabic speaking word appropriating the science of the Greeks, for instance, and being custodians for a while, and then passing it on to the uh, to the West. And uh, you, you know, so it was there was also this feeling that the anthology could challenge both this type of narrative, but also other narratives, which perhaps came from the region itself, which tended to minim not so much minimize the contribution, but only think in terms of the golden age of Islam, and then possibly the Nahda, as if nothing had happening in between. So these are all the types of, you know, the consideration that, you know, well behind, I think, the, the motivation for uh, putting the anthology together. Yeah, and I must thank, you know, the both of you You've just framed that so well. But, you know, having been a student of the Arabic language and translation since 2004, and I did my master's in 2008 from like a reputable place, like, it's just so many things you're referring to in this anthology I had no idea about and as you said it's not only you know the narrative perhaps being distorted but from our own regions it's just mm -hmm. sort of being focused on particular periods or minimized and so I really as a result I know we're just at the beginning of our talk but I mean spoiler alert to everybody in the audience the anthology is groundbreaking I mean it really is 
um, you know, whether you're familiar with Arabic translation studies or you're not. So just putting that out there. But um, yes, thank you for starting us off. So, you know, easing us into it, Miriam. Um, Tariq, would you like to add anything uh, on, on this question? Um. I mean, there are several issues. I mean, I think that's uh, generally uh, really thank. I mean, good introduction to um, our aims and methods and so on. Uh, there are two issues, of course. The um, as Maryam said, there is this traditional narrative that uh, focused on the active periods of translation, and one of the things we found out as we went through it, and as we originally were working on collecting these texts, and as they were, you know, being compiled and so on. We realized that it's, I mean, maybe there are active periods for translation, right? But definitely not for transition discourse, because mm -hmm. transition discourse and discussion of translation continued at all times. Uh, even times that are seen as and where in some in some aspects, of course, ages of decline. But it was very interesting and revealing to us to see what translation uh, meant to a lot of people in so many fields, in different contexts to theologians, to scientists, to scholars and linguists and, and, and people in all fields. And mm -hmm. people who are not translators and people who probably did not know foreign languages mm -hmm. and how translation was so much uh, richly employed and, 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 and uh, debated and discussed uh, in so many contexts throughout history, all right? And this is why originally, I mean, uh, as we started, we were aware, and actually we talked about this in Miriam, repeated that, you know, we should go beyond these two periods. So we, we were aware of that, but I think also we were a little surprised by the consistency and continuity of all these uh, debates. And sometimes there is actual continuity between them in the sense that they cite each other and so on, but also you see them at all times in different periods and so on discussing translation and so on. So that was, and some of, and how sophisticated and, and um, uh, uh, intricate some of these debates uh, were. I mean, there are sometimes theologians, Fuqaha and so on, like uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, like uh, Ash-Shatabi and so on, people who, would sometimes they were opposed to translation or to uh, the, the, the transition of Greek philosophy, but how much, uh, I mean, uh, how much effort they gave to debating and discussing translation, linguistic aspects and cultural aspects at mm. really some, some uh, elaborate level. So that was uh, very interesting and important for us. Um, also, another thing I wanted to say is, of course, we, we want to address these, these Western biases and so on, but also it was also important, and we talked about this in the introduction, not to make this the, the, the only, uh, or at least the main aim of the anthology that simply this is important because it's different because it's non-western because we don't want to see I mean transition studies at least as it, it it's growing now and the contributions of non-western cultures <clears throat> are really growing rapidly as simply west and non-west uh, because it, it kind of it may reinforce I think this uh, Eurocentrism, if you mm. <clears throat> give something an interest just because it's non-Western. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, th this is why, I mean, I'm, we're trying our, I mean, this is why I cited uh, James Baer in the introduction who talks about a more polyphonic, decentralized history of transition rather than simply in West and non-West. Mm. Uh, an ideal vision probably for the future. Uh, but I think because one important element here, and this is something that we can see that I noticed in the, it, and we both noticed in the, uh, and we don't, something we don't want to ignore is also continuities uh, and parallels with right. the Western and non-Western. Yeah, just the fact that these are non-Western doesn't mean, there are a lot of, you know, issues that you will find, uh, for example, philosophy, as uh, Maryam talked about it, there's a lot of continuity uh, uh, with Islamic philosophers from previous, not only Greek philosophers, but Hellenistic philosophers. School of Alexandria and so on in the Middle East, in the Near okay. East and in Egypt, and even Christian scholars who face similar issues mm -hmm. to Islamic scholars. And later in the translation of someone like Averroes, for example, into Europe, how also his, the way he tried to uh, conceptualize philosophy and, and, and deal, deal with issues of doing rationalist philosophy in a strictly religious monotheistic environment, and when when the when the sources are these 
pagan philosophers like you will and and how i mean later uh, european medieval translators were inspired by some of his work so these are some of the elements, cases where you see continuities with it i mean there are a lot of cases where it's not simply about western and non-western it's about simply here philosopher doing rationalist philosophy with respect to a monotheistic tradition for example right. and you'll find a lot of these parallels here so it's important while we definitely want to address these biases and so on, uh, Western biases, we don't want also to represent this as mainly non-Western and this is the uh, the main interest of it. Yeah, I applaud you both. That's such a, a really uh, valid point and a poignant one to, to keep in mind, not just with this book, but with even translations of Arabic literature in general, I think is something many of us, um, you know, uh, as transla translators can, can keep in mind. This leads me to my next question. If the both of you could please walk me through your methodology, because it seems like there is such a rich corpus of texts to choose from. How did you go about choosing the text? How many were you going to include? And also I'm aware you had, you know, a number of translators working on these texts. How, how did that come about? Yeah. Um, I think we agreed from the beginning that we will have about 40, 50 texts of, you know, kind of, kind of several pages each you know you want a, a text that is sizable but manageable too at the same time and we could have selected more of course it was quite difficult eventually to uh, and as you said there is a large corpus of other things too so um there are several factors i mean from the beginning we we decided that on the one hand there are particular texts that are more or less canonized and famous and important well known like jahez like safadi and so on uh, mm -hmm. works by, uh, you know, later Bustani, for example, in during Nahda, Suleiman al-Bustani, the Iliad. These are major texts, and even though they have been studied and so on, you cannot not include them in a work like that, in an anthology of Arabic discourse. And of course, the other element was, of course, we needed, uh, we don't want to repeat the same text, so we needed a right. lot of new texts, different things. So that was, which we had to, this is one of the, 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 uh, criteria, so to speak, for the selection, uh, this balance. Also, we looked at, we tried as much as we could to cover a variety of topics of historical periods. And as I said, originally, it was simply going to be, or that was you know, the general plan, the Abbasid period, and then, but eventually we decided into these two broad periods. And which, uh, I mean, some actually, uh, to be honest, I have, when, when I submitted the Arabic, there was some discussion or resistance to this by the peer editors, uh, peer reviewers, I and mean, what, what are the main like turning points, what are the main paradigms and so on. And we said, it's it's really difficult to talk about turning points. Now we have a lot of texts that haven't been, uh, you know, uh, studied yet. So we're kind of fine with yeah. this general broad generalization uh, division into the, these two periods. And so we wanted something that extended over these different variety of topics, variety of, uh, and of course, issues, relevance to modern transition issues, uh, issues and also contemporary, contemporary issues in Islamic and Arab history, right? Like, uh, you know, philosophy or uh, translating the Quran or political aspects of translation and so on. Uh, these are also size was important. I mean, we had a large amount of text some of these were uh, a couple of sentences, all right? So you cannot include something like that. So we want something yeah. that is uh, of, of a certain size. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, and, and this is also where the commentaries help because in the commentaries, you can also engage with other texts. And we did that, mm -hmm. texts that we did not include, all right? So uh, it was quite useful sometimes to refer some of the shorter texts, two or three sentences, to quote them, include them, or to reference uh, reference them or refer to them and bring attention to them. So I think also through the commentaries, we also brought up and 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 included and referenced uh, some good number of texts too. So that that was the general you know kind of a compromise we tried to achieve. Right. No, that's very helpful. And um, in terms of the translators. Was it simply like, uh, you know, people who yeah. both of you are familiar with, or were you looking for people who have a vested interest in this field? Yeah, all of these, I would say, I mean, and of course, people who are specialists in, in right. these, some of these texts are highly specialized, even though, of course, they're excerpts, but still are talking texts in theology, in philosophy, 
I mean, one of the most difficult ones was Ibn Taymiyyah because he uses Islamic fiqh and so on. So mm. Adam Gargani was a specialist more or less in Islamic theology and so on. And so it was people we knew, but also we, we tried as much as we could to contact people to, uh, sometimes people, and Mona Baker also was a consultant and she, and, and she contributed, she helped a lot with this. So sometimes just searching and sometimes looking at texts, people who worked on Islamic philosophy, for example, or uh, classical linguistics or the Nahda period and so on. So right. we looked for all kinds of people or we contact and we contacted them. And a lot of times, of course, some people, and these are predominantly, if not all of them, uh, professors, sometimes some academics. Students. academics. Sometimes they don't have a lot of time. <laughs> they have yeah. To, yeah, give. Uh, so, so eventually, you know, some people could, some people couldn't and so on. Uh, so it took some time, but we could find uh, this, you know, number of really dedicated and, and qualified mm -hmm. scholars who did it in, in their different way. Yeah. It's, it's definitely reflected in the translation itself. Um, thank you, Thodic. Miriam, would you, did you want right, to? Yes, just yeah. to, I think the, the, the variety, and again, it's this, you know, the diversity of voices, et cetera, more among the translators was quite useful as well from the point of view of the, the terminology that was going to be used as part of, uh, um, to, to refer to translation issues. Because mm -hmm. this, this, this is, you know, something that I think we were both oh. very much aware of when we were, for instance, whether we were, you know, discussing a test or a text or um, uh, translating it, that we were using the, 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 the terminology we were using in English was, mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, impacted um, by our backgrounds, whether where we have studied, right. what type, even within translation studies, I would say, you know, which type of translation studies were, you know, were you involved in? And, and terms as such as, you know, equivalence, for instance, do come with a certain baggage, etc. cetera. And, um, and it, it could have been quite, you know, it, it, I suppose one could have been prescriptive uh, this is not the way uh, we chose to work. So the, I think that the translators were also approaching uh, translation studies concepts from the, the point of, you know, from their own perspectives. Mm. Um, you know, so yeah. You've definitely uh, just addressed one of my, my next questions, which was sort of what were the realizations or you know, things you became aware of while working on this anthology. And Miriam, you just touched upon something which I think is really key, but I never really thought about is the sort of diversity or um, different ways in which you can discuss translation itself based on where, you know, your what you've been grounded in. So I'd like to pose this question to the both of you. Like, you know, if you just have to pick maybe one or two, something that was unexpected that you, like, came to know after working on this anthology? It could, it could really be anything, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, besides what I mentioned earlier about this continuity. Consist of, yes, course, yeah. Uh, also this diversity also in translation uh, in the classical period, for example, because I mean, uh, we think of translation there as translation from foreign languages like Greek and Persian sometimes and other languages, but I wasn't aware of of, of how much translation was going on inside the Islamic empire itself. Uh, in contexts like courts, for example, theological, like uh, translating the Quran to other Muslims, for example, and also in uh, administration, uh, in, uh, in the court system, in the legal system. And this is why you have a lot of theologians and Faha and so on discussing, uh, you know, the, the, for example, interpreting, interpreting for judges interpreting for kings and rulers and so on, because the, there was a lot of ethnic and linguistic diversity, even among Muslims, all right? Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of this translation going on. This is not something, I think, when you, when you talk about translation in classical Arabic, we think of translating Greek, Greek philosophy, some literature, some Persian literature, Indian, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. Kind of community, community translation and interpreting that was going on, sometimes between rulers and subjects, all right? And sometimes with communities where uh, there is a, uh, a theologian, Faqih al-Yusi, which I quoted in the introduction, who talks about 
Morocco and how there's a local Muslim community there who are Muslims that do not speak Arabic and how they had difficulties sometimes in uh, understanding uh, or the basic terms and how this created some, some, some uh, uh, confusion and some conflict in the community because people were demanding that some, some Islamic scholars that they know the Arabic terms, you know, very thoroughly what they did and so on. So to me, this was one, and of course you see cases where you have rulers who spoke Arabic or did not, and subjects who did not speak, spoke Arabic did not, and translation took place, yeah. So this is an area where I think has not been studied, I think at all. And to me, you know, uh, mm -hmm. this is a new dimension, whole new dimension of translation that needs a lot of further study. Um, another element probably is also official translation and how much it was sometimes uh, institutionalized and, and organized. Mm. You look at uh, the Mamluk period, for example, and here also you see these relations, very early relations between the Mamluk Sultanate in Egypt and Italian cities, uh, the Hafsid Kingdom al Hafsiyun in Tunisia, which probably has not been studied at all and these treaties with Italian cities. And you look also at the work in interpreters there and how you have these treaties, treaties uh, you know, describing and, 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 and institutionalizing the, the work of the translators, how there are specific clear rules and legal systems about, if you look at Kalkashandi also the, in Egypt, the Mamluk period, early, early 15th century, he talks about government departments, translation departments, and you have all these uh, ranks of translators, you have all these procedures for uh, authenticating translations and archiving them and so on. Uh, in, in the, even in the Nahda, you know, we have texts from the early, like Ahmed Zaki Basha and his translate, his work, early 20th century Egypt. And you see also their government departments and how there are specific uh, official translation tests and uh, several levels of translation, several levels of transition departments and so on, and how the, all yeah. these things were in place. So to me yeah. also, that was something quite interesting to see that, uh, you know, this, this level of specialization and, and institutional uh, establishment of transition. Yeah, the codification of it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's very funny. What was very interesting as well, and which surprised me was to see how much information there was about translation and about the debates about translation in you know at the time of the Nahda um, in non uh, non canonical type of literature I mean press cuttings the discussions about you know translation as appropriation is translation good for modernization what are the the risks wow. in, or competition some um, um, journal uh, sort of asking secondary school pupils to uh, write essays about whether translation is a good thing or not translation from European languages into Arabic and this was in the in the press you know in the nascent press but, and I and there was so much information there the, you know but I suppose a press press cuttings are not normally the stuff that you would include in, in an anthology but they it was very, very interesting, you know, I, I didn't expect so much to be found there. Mm. One of the, the surprises. Um, yeah. yeah, it just shows that we're still very much, uh, you know, ruminating on those very same questions <laughs> like till today. Uh, yeah, so, okay. Uh, to, Move on to my next question. So as I've already said, I was struck by a number of things, but I'd like to start with uh, Butrus al-Bustani and his translation of Robinson Crusoe, uh, which is included in the anthology uh, excerpt, you know, his um, translator's notes. So from English into Arabic for to clarify for the audience, which was in 1861. Um, as is written in the anthology, Al-Bustani made a huge contribution to the translation of European literature into Arabic during the Nahda era. And in the description of Al-Bustani's work as translated by Ruth Abu Rashid, I was hardened to read that trans, this is, and I start the quote, translators' prefaces, footnotes, and epigraphs were employed by Nahda literary translator um, 
it's clearly the case with Al Bustani. Like it was a regular occurrence for Al Nahda translators to have all this sort of paratext that they have created. And Al Bustani not only wrote a preface to his work, uh, the translation of Robinson Crusoe, but he also added a title of his own on top, like, which is on in the book, as I understand it, it's above the actual title from the source language. And his title is the Bustanian gem of the Crucian biography, um, which is before, yes, the voyage of Robinson Crusoe. So this leads me to, with the current conversation around how important really is a translator when it comes to a published translation, right? Whether it's having our name on the cover or writing a translator's note, being mentioned in publicity materials or receiving royalties for our work, could you share what the status of the translator was in the classical and Nahda period, in your opinion? Um, any sort of, uh, you know, observations you had on that? Um, okay. Um, well, the, the classical uh, period, the, um, the sort of you know, mid, Middle Ages, the, the translator seems to be to be in, in quite a high position. Um, but I think in terms of, there's, there's are lots of references in the historiographies about how much they were paid and the gold they were receiving, um, the mm -hmm. kind of honors and favors that were bestowed upon them. They were valuable, um, you know, to, to, to the, be, you know, to the empire that was being built, etc., and um, they they are listed in the historiography historiographers' books, for instance, amongst the uh, sometimes depending on because many many of the translators were also had other specialisms. For instance, they could have you know um, with you know, to do with philosophy or like Hanani Ibn Ishaq with medicine. Right. So, but the, the you know the, the translators could be listed among the wise uh, men, um, among the amongst the philosophers, the physicians, depending on on the the actual you know compilation we are referring to, or amongst translators as well. So they they, they really were flagged up and made quite visible in that uh, in that respect, and their contribution to the um, development of science. And construction of knowledge was was really um, um, owned owned up. But however, the the patronage was there all the time. So in 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 mm. in a sense, they were also hostages to fortune. You know, if they oh. fell out of favor, uh, the translators. Or, you know, again, uh, like Hanani Ibn is a, is an example of that. At some point, he was he was um, actually he was working as a as a doctor as a physician for the Khalif al Mutawakkil. And due to some rumors at court, he fell out of favor and was sent to prison. So you can fall from high as well. Wow. But certainly, it sounds as if you know, being a, being a, the translators were honored and and seen as uh, uh, useful uh, contributors. Um, I'm not so sure about the, the, I think perhaps the Nahda, you'd have both because you also, in, you have this, you know, you mentioned El, El Bustani and who was a very visible um, agent there and uh, and made himself very visible as well. But, but you also have comments, for instance, from, I think it was actually uh, Mohammed Ali referring to translation and not wanting the, uh, El Tahtawi, who is a you know very large figure of the Nahda, uh, doing more than just just translate and not not spend too much time on discussing about it, etc. So mm. I would say the two, but probably a plus rather than a minus in terms of the status of of, of the translator. I mean I, I don't know, but the Nahda. I mean the, very often the translators were themselves uh, authors and. So it was quite, quite a you know complex uh, uh, setup as well. There were, there were really it was at the heart of the literary debates. Wow. Yes. You know, just before you talked about falling from great heights, I was thinking, oh, it would be so lovely to return, you know, to that era as a translator. 
<laughs> like you talked about going to jail. I was like, actually, scratch that. Um, thank you, Miriam, for such a vivid depiction of you know what translators were sort of considered as and seen at that time. Tariq, do you want to add anything or we're okay? Well, generally, I'm, I think, yeah, one point, and this is something that Miriam said is kind of, I think uh, with, with the Mahada, most of these translators, at least the visible ones, were also intellectuals in their own right and writers. Mm -hmm. and so, on. so if you have like Butros al Bustani or Suleiman al Bustani, even, or Georgi Zidane, uh, and then these people, and uh, Tahtawi, of course. Uh, because, of course, foreign language was more widespread. Uh, I mean, and of course, you had to be, you know, a modernizer, you had to know foreign language. And so they saw translation as part of the reforming and modernizing mm -hmm. mission at that time. Uh, um, I'm not sure. I mean, they, and there was a lot of evaluation and high respect for translation, but also they definitely did not see themselves only on as translators. Mm -hmm. The classical period, you had someone like Hunayn and so on, but you have a lot or more who were translators. And that's mm. it, mm. because I mean, foreign language was such a Greek, in this case, a, a rare commodity, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, but during Al-Nahda, I mean, uh, intellectuals and modernizers and so on, they had to, I mean, I mean, modernizing, at least for more secular ones like the Georges Zidane, for example, or uh, mm. the, these people. So, I mean, to them, so this is why I think you have the translators, I mean, of course, there were translators who translated for the commercial commercial press, you know, kind of uh, uh, sensational novels and so on. But at least the visible transit translators, we you know, did not see themselves only as translators. Mm. Uh, and so this is, I think, a factor there, you see, because they saw translation as, as one of their activities, one of their important activities, mm -hmm. modernizing and reforming and so on. Right. And that's, well, I think, a difference from the classical period. Multidisciplinary, yeah. Uh, just because I have you both here and I'm curious, uh, before we move on to our next question, what is your view of the translator in the Arab world today? Do you think, you know, compared to what we've just been discussing, like what is the status of the translator either working into Arabic or out of Arabic, whether in an academic setting or a commercial one or a literary one, if either of you have any uh, you know, insight into this or personal experience you'd like to share. Tariq is smiling. Well, I don't know if it's, um, yeah, I mean, um, you don't, I mean, of course it's different. I think it's more specialized and technical now. I mean, uh, during Nahda, you have, you know, these scholars um, who, uh, translated, but even in their translation, the way they translate, like mentioned, but Russell Bustani, even Suleiman and Bustani, and so on. And of course, Maron, Maron Nakash, who started the first Arabic theater, uh, he started with the Miser, or which kind of a, probably a loose translation of Moliere. Mm -hmm. uh, so the translation itself was kind of quite, um, you have the personality of, of the and the style and the, the even modernizing project of the scholar. I think today it's a lot more compartmentalized and specialized and so on in terms of literary translators. And of course the, the type of translation that was done there in terms of the creative uh, domesticating, uh, even transculturation of these works is not quite acceptable today. I mean, people look now and yeah. they say, well, that was, that was uh, a distortion, et cetera. This kind of transition does not work anymore. So I think these are some differences. The importance of transition is still there, of course, and the need mm -hmm. for it, all right? But, uh, you know, as I said, it's, it's kind of a more specialized, not on these large scales of modernizing projects, at least with these scholars. Right, right. Yeah, because today you find mostly translators are specialized. You don't have someone like, um, Al Yazaji, for example, or Ibrahim Al Yazaji, so on, who, who was a scholar, encyclopedist, and also a translator mm. within this, this general project. Mm. Thank you. And Miriam, what's your view on you know, the status of translators in the Arab world or translators working from into Arabic today? Well, I, th I think the issue of specialization that uh, Tarek and you know, developed is, is an important one. 
I get the impression that they are that you have very contradicting situations, and it's not just in the Arab world. In mm. the whole, trans, you know, in my view, the um, you, I don't think you can talk of a Western situation for translators because they are so they are different. You know, the, the profession is as you. you no, is different, is regulated in different ways, depending on whether you are in the UK or in France, in Germany. And I think you have, you have probably the highest status translators who work in certain, perhaps international or regional organizations who, who um, belong to uh, professional associations, but unfortunately you also have, um, uh, translators who would accept to work for very very low rates who are um, and right. whose work is not necessarily considered and I I mean my impression is that you know you you have this kind of contradicting situations in in the Arab world uh, as well when you you could have sort of high profile translator training institutions which have been established I mean you know for quite quite a few decades and decades but there still seems to be um, work being carried out by, I suppose, people who are, happen to be, or who see themselves as bilingual. Mm. I think it's mm. quite, uh, I think there's, you know, it's a la lack of regulation is probably perhaps the most striking aspect. Right, yeah. Um, I just wanted to take this moment to remind the audience to please pop in your questions into the Q&A. We currently have two, but we'll be coming to it in about 10 minutes or so, and it doesn't have to cover anything that we have spoken about. Um, you know, you can also talk about something more generally, uh, you know, Tarek and Miriam, are, we were just so lucky to have them both here with us today. And so feel free to, to pick their brains on something in particular, um, you know uh if you have a burning question so yeah moving on to my next question because i'm so lucky i have a whole list of them uh okay so this one is quite dear to my heart as you know i used to be a teacher which is that the latter half of the book which is which covers the Nahda period includes a few texts on translation teaching such as guide for the modern translator and translation lessons what was your reaction to finding these detailed texts on translation uh, teaching method, methods? Sorry, I'll, re I'll say that again. What was your reaction to finding these detailed texts on translation teaching methods from the early 1990s? Uh, sorry, early 1900s. And how do you think the practice of translation teaching has evolved today? Is there anything that we can actually incorporate or you know, include in our classrooms today from the Nahda approach? Uh, I think these were quite interesting to find. I mean, and um, uh, I mean, they're not the first ones, but I was also surprised, we were surprised how uh, some of it, uh, especially in the early 20th century, uh, quite sophisticated. I mean, uh, especially that they were intended for high schools, I mean, or not for college yeah. or anything like that. And how advanced, because uh, it, it kind of developed, it seems, because we have, you look at, uh, there was a book in uh, the, I referenced this in the commentary in the uh, 19th century, uh, 1850, by someone called Khalifa bin Mahmoud, who worked at the Dar al Ansan, the School of Translation in Egypt, which was, and it was supposed to be a guide for translators, but if you look at it, it's, it's mainly about language. There's a glossary of French, uh, Arabic, and Ottoman Turkish. Uh, something about the grammatical rules and so on. Nothing really about translation skills as such. Mm. Uh, these texts, early early 20th century, uh, seems there's a, a real leap, you know, from in terms of the, you know addressing transition. And they obvious. I mean, they uh, explicitly say it's beyond. It's not only knowing the two languages, but transition skills, and they talk about creating. Also, as opposed to the general style there, maybe this is also because of the academic context, the general style was tended to be quite adaptive during Nahada, quite, you know, taking liberties and so on, but they kind of tried to create a balance between, in their instructions to students and so on, between, you know, uh, you know, uh, fluency of style and so on, uh, which was the main consideration then. 
and also fidelity in, uh, and so on. And, uh, and of course, they seemed also to be also in touch with, uh, with current then uh, uh, linguistic theories and so on. Uh, so that, that's quite, quite a, an important. And of course, there is a lot more to be done there, I think, to, to look into these texts. And of course, uh, I mean, when we looked at was the textbook, which kind of represents more or less the curriculum. The right. practice, you don't know how it worked. And I don't know, you know, like a lot of further study would be, would be very interesting into this area. Mm. So, um, today, I'm not, I mean, I can't say for, but for sure, but for example, one thing in these texts is that they, uh, one of them discusses how uh, the distinction between translation and language learning and how translation mm. uh, uh, well, was, was used in language learning, but now it is not. Uh, or, or, but they, they argue against this. They say, well, this is kind of something we can still do. And kind of, I think this debate, it still resonates with, with I think, modern, modern uh, debates about learning language. I mean. Definitely. Exactly. I mean, I think in, in, in recent, I mean, it mostly in throughout probably the 20th, second half of the 20th century, <clears throat> what dominated more was a communicative approach to language learning, that is, you don't introduce the foreign language at all, you don't use translation, etc. But there are also some also recent, to some extent also, uh, arguments that maybe we can use translation, could translation could play a part in, in, uh, in uh, I mean, we shouldn't try necessarily to avoid it, at least in teaching language for adults as opposed to children. Mm. So that's a, that's still a current debate and still an important debate today, and I think we can we can uh, learn from it. Learn from that, yeah. Um, Esco, going back to the you know the point about how how could you use you know how in in terms of teaching, um, you know what what use could the anthology be? Um, I think I'd like to, you know, perhaps tie this in with, the, you know, our earlier discussion and uh, uh, Tarek mentioned the, the convergence aspect as opposed to highlighting differences. It's, you know, the, the, the Arabic tradition is a tradition amongst others in, in trans, you know, in translation. And I, I, what I would like to see is some of the, uh, perhaps some of the specific texts, um, you know, either the paratext or translators talking about their works, or mm. their work, or observer commenting, an observer commenting on a translator's work. This could be used to um, illustrate some translation issues. For instance, you know, you can you can think of a course in uh, translation studies, perhaps. In a, um, so you know, you you kind of move away. It's not just about you know San Jerome or Cicero, but Hanani ibn Ishaq has things to say as well, or you know, or others. So I you know I would see the the anthology could be used perhaps in in that um, in that way. Um, examples of term formation or problems of standardization, um, you know, which appear already in the in the. Uh, Baghdad school, you know, those, those issues that uh, come to the fore, or of course the issue of uh, translating uh, sacred texts, which, you know, remain, remain contemporary uh, issues. Yes. Um, but I, I perhaps as a, as a more, more general level, I'd like to uh, see it as also it's just part of our common heritage in a sense and it doesn't it's not just for Arabic um, as this you know I mentioned this uh, concept of the culture of translation which you know even does and, and I think this is where the anthology could be used as well you know it's all the, all those wonderful different traditions that um, are, you know different but the same at, at the same time so you know I think this is how I'd, I would like to to see it you know certainly not as a different tradition but right. as how the same issues come again and again and the problems are very often the same in different contexts but you know it's yeah, yeah. thank you Miriam and thought I feel like we could go on and on, um, but we do have a, a good number of questions from the audience, which we will turn to now. And so those are just in the Q&A function. I'll be reading them a lot, but in case you would also like to read along, they're just there if you'd like to access them at the bottom of your screen. 
Thank you everyone for these questions. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Rahaf's question. And she has said that um, as a PhD student who is engaged with women writers in the Middle East, I would love to ask about women translators during an nahda Were there any? And how do you th think that this was reflected in texts? How do you think that this reflected on texts in general, the ones which were translated? Well, I'm, I don't know much about uh, women translators in the Nahda, and, uh, but I must say that when I was earlier on talking about the wise men, I, I hesitated and I, I sort of thought, well, I really ought to say wise men and women. <laughs> and, I said, actually, and then I thought, but I'm not in a position, you know, probably just ignorance of <laughs> mentioning a, a specific translator. I know there were some, certainly in, I think in Morocco, there's a, quite a, there, there was a medieval translator, I can't remember her name. Um, oh. I'm not sure about the Nahda, and if there was translation uh, performed, I'm not sure that the translator herself would have been visible, but I, I, I really don't have more, more information, but it's certainly worth investigating. And I look forward to reading that PhD. Yes, yeah, me yeah. too, because I think it definitely is an issue of visibility. I mean, you know, I don't doubt that they were there. Um, but, and and Tariq, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, this kind of question crossed my mind at some stage while we were putting the anthology together. But uh, I mean, the classical period, I mean, that'll be, I mean, I, I didn't know of any translators, I mean, in the classical period that that work i mean uh, i mean if you look at it i mean uh, i mean we have poets and you know of course and sometimes there are scholars occasionally women not the translators and it, it, it was kind of very specialized i mean if you look at it during the Abbasid period the translators were in the beginning syriac translators and sometimes persian secretaries to the state and there were a lot of states, it seems it was a really good job, you know, I mean, as Maryam said, they were very well paid and, and so it was some kind of a monopoly over it. I mean, sometimes these families, the translation, the position of the translator or secretary passing from son, from father to son and so on. Um, and it was a class of secretaries that, that controlled this. So this could be a part of it, I think that, you know, kind of this, this, um, the way it was institutionalized and was monopolized. And some of the texts you look at, you see the stakes at translation, how when when some people lost their privileges as trans, like when the, the switching, for example, in Diwans from you know using Persian to or Greek to Arabic. Uh, so this could be a factor that I mean, these uh, were not only translators. Uh, as such, like you to trans, I mean, they were government officials, more or less, and made it patron so on. And probably this is a factor that would have made it uh, more difficult for women. Uh, now the period, I'm not quite sure. I mean, there are also, maybe we need further research. I mean, uh, there were novelists, for example, and especially recent research in, in, in during Nahda period shows a lot of you know pioneering novelists you know, like Zainab Fawaz and so on mm -hmm. 19th century and so on and and there were also women magazines that were established by some feminists and so on uh, so but in terms of of course what we're looking here is not only translation we're looking at paratexts and, and discussions of translation we don't see we don't have a lot of visibility for women translators who are few to begin with. So I, I agree with Miriam. And I mean, we, we really need more research. Into this. So Thank you. Yeah, so we have a comment from Marilyn in the audience who I'm guessing might be Marilyn Booth, but I'm not sure which Marilyn it is. So I don't want to as assume. Yeah, but this Marilyn has said that um, women, so she had commented in the Q&A that there were definitely women translating and writing about translation. And I, Nariman, you said had, had said that yes, Meziada um, was translating, and uh, Marilyn has said yes, Meziada for sure, but others before her too. And there were also quite a few Ottoman women translating from French into Ottoman. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. Great. I mean, this would be 
if in the future we have a second edition, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah. I call for a second edition focusing primarily on uh, you know women translators in case anybody oh, would really? would like yeah. would like to take that on. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so moving on to our second question we have is from Yasin. Uh, they say, hi, I'm Yasin, graduate student at Princeton. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today and for your fascinating book, which I look forward to reading. I wanted to ask you about the Arabic language scholarship on translation. Could you tell us how these discourses are dealt with in Arabic language academia and how your book positions itself in comparison with what has been published in Arabic. Thank you so much. So I think just to unpack it, um, what are the discussions currently about translation discourse in Arabic language scholarship? Uh, and how is the book positioned in comparison to what's already been published in Arabic on this topic? Mm -hmm. if, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, it's definitely a contribution to this and we hope to move it further. Uh, I think there's a discussion of transition in Arabic and English too, to some extent. As we said in the beginning, too much focus on the golden age, the specific transition periods, all right? And sometimes, and sometimes also in terms of, and this is something that started in Nahda, in, in uh, um, glorifying that period and you know using it as kind of a uh, incentive for modern transition, which is mm -hmm. fine. But we try, what we try to add is, as we said, this uh, expanding the discussion to include translation in all periods and also in all different contexts and, and, and new fields of transition to look at for further study, like, as I said, community translation, interpreting at war during Islamic conquest and uh, even the theological debates and so on. So I think it is within this, but we try, and of course, and, and as, a, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned before, in terms of uh, uh, periodization. I mean, the, the traditional periodization, which is Abbasid period, then decline, and then mm -hmm. Nahda, is quite, is quite restricted, quite narrow here. And so we, and I mentioned, I think, and we mentioned in the introduction that we're, it's kind of, uh, I mean, new periodization, and this is something also <laughs> the peer reviewers in Arabic asked for, is beyond this, but this could be a future direction, you know, kind of looking at transition paradigms, transition periods through all this large history. So it's it's a step. So I thought I hope it will encourage more research into this. Definitely, yeah, it's a springing board. Um, Miriam, would you like to come in on this question? On the um, um, scholarship in Arabic on, yes. on translation studies. Um, I, I agree with you know the point that Tarek made about the the, the fact that the uh, nine ten centuries are really and, and the Nahda tend to be the one that are um, repackaged and presented as of course very productive periods in terms of um, and, and I think that might be sometimes a problem because the production is so is so big that you you know, you concentrate on the production, they translate this and this and that, and maybe you don't give enough space to the conceptualization, the debate about translation itself, the mm. questioning of it in some of the literature. I also find that sometimes the, the way of presenting the translation movement, and certainly the, um, uh, the Baghdad school, etc., can be a little um, uh, hegemonic. Um, I'm, to, to trying to explain something that happened with one reason only, why well, there's a wealth of m motivations. And I, um, you know, and I'm thinking here of uh, Gutas's book on, um, um, on Greek the Abbasid, Greek, okay. Greek to Arabic. Greek on, thought, on, yeah. Uh, Greek uh, thought, Arabic, I think, yeah, Greek thought like Arabic culture, yeah, which yeah. is extremely interesting because he really unpacks all the motivations that were behind the translation movement there. Uh, of course, the impetus given by Islam, both philosophically in terms of the seeking science and also empire building, a unifying language, 
but there were also all the personal motivations that mm. you know the different caliphs the different sponsors the translators and themselves and their preferences etc so uh, perhaps that's the it, it's a kind of complexity that sometimes is might be lacking in certain in certain words from the point of view of the, you know, the more contemporary translation studies um, again, it depends very much on, on the background of the um, of the authors themselves. You know, in the same way as you know, Tarek and I will have been influenced by what our you know academic background was and what languages we were working were, with. Uh, you can you know you would have, um, for instance, a lot of focus on more linguistic or te text linguistic approaches to translation in the Arab world. I think this seems to have text linguistics seem to really have uh, um, motivated and led to quite a few publications. Um, but by the same token, sometimes for uh, countries of the, the Maghreb, um, you know, it's the French or scholarship in French that is influencing some some of the research so it's it's quite it's quite um, varied I, I, I would say um, right in in that sense yes. yeah no this is good to include definitely yes as well the scholarship in, in French um, thank you our next question is from Dr. Ahmed who has said does the anthology focus on into Arabic or from Arabic and why or is it balanced in its approach when choosing texts for the anthology? Well, it's, it's mainly about discourse about translation. And so this, for the most part, was translation into Arabic. But also there are discussions of transition from Arabic, like the Quran, especially in, in the classical period, uh, like the theologians I mentioned, like or Fuqaha, like Ibn Taymiyyah or Shatabi. They talked about translating, and there was one called Hamad bin Bilal al Hanafi who talks about translate uh, prayer in translation. If you can uh, pray in in another language, you translate some you know uh, the prayer in Arabic and pray in another language. So uh, so it it it. I mean, the classical period I would say it was predominantly into Arabic, and especially quite often with regard to Greek philosophy or to holy texts like the Bible, Old Testament, and New Testament. Uh, and it was when it was transitioned into other languages, it was the Quran. Uh, I think the Nahda period was basically the same thing. I mean, I mean, Nahda is a period of translation from European languages for modernization and reform, so on. So it was predominantly transitioned into into uh, uh, into Arabic. And of course, as I said, there were some also uh, uh, intellectuals like Rashid Rida and so on who talked about translating the Quran and so on. And this was uh, all religious texts and this was into other languages. Mm. Uh, so apart from, I would say, translating the Quran, I mean, it was, I would say generally, it was translation into Arabic. Um, there is some, uh, like Georgi Zidan, for example, uh, in some genres who early 19th century, uh, uh, talk about uh, Muhammad Kurd Ali also in, 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 in Syria, who talk about uh, Orientalism occasionally. The, you mentioned them talking about uh, uh, Orientalist writing about the Arab world and so on. So there is some nascent also uh, study. This would be an interesting also subject for further studies and with early uh, awareness of Orientalism and Orientalist work and so on. Although we didn't find, as far as I can remember, like further like detailed discussions of the translations themselves, all right? Uh, there's also Shadiaq, I remember for yeah. that, Ahmed Farish Shadiaq, who is included, who talks about, generally he, he worked in a, translating the Bible with uh, uh, Samuel Lee, an English scholar, uh, in, the, in the mid 19th century. The, the main work was that he talked about his work translating the Bible into Arabic, but at the same time, he did comment on some uh, uh, European uh, English Orientalists who translate like uh, Lane, who translated the Arabian Nights and the Quran and uh, other, are, yeah, in, in a very critical way, quite often. So, so I would say, yeah, and, and another I think was mainly into Arabic, but there is the Quran and there is also, I think, this burgeoning understanding of Orientalism and the representation of the Arab world in 
other languages and how they were translated, which is an important area. Right. And Miriam, would you like to tag on anything to to thought? No, I think that's, uh, I, okay. I think I want to add to this now. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Our next question is sort of similar to Tariq, which we've just touched upon in terms of how languages are being translated into Arabic. This is a question from Salam, who has said, can you uh, please address the issue of mistranslation from English and French to Arabic? Uh, they read that Satra's What is Literature was mistranslated by a student of Idris. Uh, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, you know, the specific mistranslation, but would either of you like to talk about uh, specifically during the classical era in the Nahda period, if there were also what is considered mistranslation, you know, because we do know the trend. Oh, yeah. Guess, yeah. <laughs> well, it's quite, um, it's, it's quite a question. I mean, mistranslation affects all language combinations and and then you know what is mistranslation who has the really right right answer certainly when you look at the uh, again i mean i'm going back to Hanain's epistle um yes the, there are often mentions of the translator mistranslated such term or mistranslated such text and then explaining why he may have done so and very often it's because his language skills were not up to the job or because he didn't know about the subject, which is quite interesting from a translation um, point, point of view. Right. Um, I don't think, I mean, he, the fact, I mean, thinking of, of the, the Nahda, the fact that uh, quite a few of the translations were very free and very creative. Mm. I mean, to what extent can these, these be called mistranslation um, when Greek, or when you know not, not Greek I mean it's French you know Racine's tragedies are translated into the Egyptian vernacular from French um, and what is a tragedy in this you know in the Greek sense becomes um, um, a happier story where uh, you know the the good the good people are not punished at the end by venge vengeful gods um, is this a mistranslation? Is it mm. a recreation? So I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, there, there must be, yes, there must be text of in, instances of mistranslation. There all will, will be with translation generally, but I'm, I'm not sure. I can't mm. think of a specific example here. Mm. No, but the one that you actually have just cited is, is, is a wonderful example of Hassin's work. Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is, I agree with with, uh, with Miriam is, mis I mean, there are cases, of course, where uh, you find misunderstandings. I mean, that's like, there are cases, whether in the classical period or Nahda period, where, you know, sometimes uh, some Greek terms or Greek philosophy terms and so on in medicine were misunderstood, or it wasn't sometimes clear to the translator what they are. So they would use a borrowing, for example, in order to wait until this is more understood. And Hunayn bin Ishaq talks about this, how, you know, some translators, mm -hmm. uh, he talks mainly about style, I think, but he does talk about also mistranslations. Ibn Sina talks about mistranslating medical terms sometimes into Arabic and how this could lead sometimes to problems like mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, kind of uh, disease is called forgetfulness or something like that. I quoted this. And so there are cases like that, but the larger picture is one actually of adaptation. And I agree, it, it's kind of, mm. there are a lot of cases where the translators know what they're doing. <laughs> they know that they're addressing a particular environment, particular time. So in the classical period, in translating Greek philosophy, they definitely Islamicized a lot of texts. And speaking of ending, happy ending, like Kalila Wadimna, for example, there was <laughs> the Lan Muqaffa added a chapter of a strongly Islamic character where the evil, the villain, uh, uh, who is uh, Kalila, I think, is put on trial and condemned and so on, which is an addition to the original Persian and original uh, Sanskrit text. Uh, they sometimes removed references to gods and uh, polytheism, all right? Wow. Well, that period, of course, there was a lot of this, and of course, I mean, there were I mean, I mean, of course, understandably, in the classical period, of course, they were trying to adapt 
uh, to make Greek philosophy or philosophy generally acceptable to an Islamic readership, right? And not mm-hmm. also, especially when uh, they were introducing new genres, right? Like the theater or the novel, fiction. I think one reason simply was, the, I mean, they had to be adaptive because you're introducing a new form. So in the beginning, they kind of start by degrees. So you see works that are translated using saja, uh, rhyme prose, you know, classical fiction. And of course, they, and of course, another factor was also there was a, sometimes moral objections. Right. Uh, translate. I mean, uh, some conservative critics, you know, would, would say they were, you're introducing European manners, uh, foreign manners, uh, some of this, especially the kind of literature sometimes that was popular adventure and sensational, sometimes uh, love stories and uh, romance and so on. So there are objections by some people that that this uh, could lead could could be immoral, could lead to mislead the youth or something like mm-hmm. that. So translators also were quite sensitive sometimes about this. So sometimes they would they would change, they would add some moral dimensions. There's a really good example that Miriam mentioned. Um, so yeah, so I mean, you have to look at the context and the time and what people were trying to do with their these facts. So there is definitely, of course, there is mistranslation always in any context, but there is something bigger here, which is quite um, uh, intentional. And I mean, we have to put it in its context. It's quite creative sometimes. Yeah, I think that also addresses another question that had come, which is, you know, what elements of an original text, this is by Catherine Collum, um, should translators aim to preserve, given that so much has to be sacrificed? Uh, but I, w- would either of you just want to give a, a, a quick response before we move on to our final question? Now that we've discussed everything that isn't really <laughs> kept, what, what, what should we, what should we focus on keeping or bringing across? Yeah. Well, um, sorry, the, the question, you know, it's almost existential. Yeah. You point. Um, I, I would find it, uh, I mean, my, you know, it's, I would find it useful to think in terms of what is the translation, what is it for, mm-hmm. and what matters there. And if, um, if we take a literary text and the purpose of the translation is to show how the source language or how it um, deals with different devices, what type of images and metaphors are used. Therefore, you could argue that it's important to stay as close as possible to the text. If mm-hmm. you are translating uh, literature as I, and look at it as world literature, um, maybe there is something else that you need, you need to, to, to get out of the text and then you have to be creative and 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 maybe end up with doing that some you know some people would call um, mistranslations and uh, I I mean if I can very briefly give an example of the and and this is nothing to do with the Nahda because it is actually the translations of uh, Nagib Mahfouz into French and into Arabic um, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at this as an example of world literature. Mm. I suppose, you know, as Nagi Mahfouz being consecrated through the uh, literature, you know, the Nobel um, Prize. Um, when you compare the French and the English translation, they have very different. Uh, they, they, their focus is very different. And one, the English translation will be, in a sense, much less exotizing. Much m- the the text in English sounds much more natural somehow. The French translation is very erudite with quite a few footnotes, which are you know, very oh. good in some ways, but at the same time may break some connection there is between the reader and the, and the author and, and the book. So, mm. uh, I mean, this is just to give an example to me, I mean, what, what has to be sacrificed? I think it really depends very much on the the purpose of your of your translation, I, I would I wouldn't be able to answer in absolute terms. That's right. So. No, that in itself, uh, I've never heard anybody comparing the compar- the translations of Mahfouz into English and French, and just your mm-hmm. even you know surface level observations are so intriguing. Um, <laughs> uh, Tariq, would you like to share 
I, I agree with Maryam. Maryam. I, mean, really, I mean, of course, there are mistranslations. There are cases when you look at it and say, well, there is a misunderstanding here, you know, that, and of course, bearing in mind the intention. But it's, I mean, here what we have, I think, is the relevant some historical examples, some cases of translators working in different times under different conditions. And I, I mean, here, you know, we know what they're trying to do or we try to understand. And it's it's something I think it's beyond misunderstanding. Or I mean, of course, when we get with this issue, we get beyond this issue. Uh, they have their readers, they had their goals, and they had I mean the aim of creating quite often something new in the receiving culture. So yeah, I mean uh, here uh, I would say the creative translation is fine. You know, I mean uh, you cannot. I mean, you would judge it, I think, based on the aims of the translators and, and the impact that it made and what they were trying to do and so on and uh, in, in the target uh, culture. Uh, sure. I mean, like one example, I mean, Michael Cooperson, I didn't attend, actually, I was planning to attend his. Uh, I also have to watch the recording. Yeah, yeah I heard yeah, it. I mean, brilliant. He translated the maqamat into English into in a very creative way he sometimes mm. like like Chaucer sometimes like uh, uh, Samuel Johnson and his Pepys and so on uh, I can't say this is a mistranslation this is a very creative transition and this is his purpose he tries to emphasize you to show connections similarities and adapt the work in certain ways to readers who can connect with it in new ways right right so, yeah that's a yeah that's um, a very how should I, it's, it's a very contemporary yeah, example. Yeah, I mean, so just understanding the goals and aims and so on, and you know, being aware of you know your context. The context, as yes. simple as that seems. Yeah, <laughs> it's the basic principles, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, I wanted to just tie up our session. Our final question, which has come through from a number of people in the chat. Um, uh, is well first of all they're all congratulating you for this wonderful anthology and some people have said they've cited it in their dissertation um, or that they you know are going to get a copy of it and um, the main question is what is next are the both of you planning another anthology is there another is, is that in the cards or what are you working on currently like what what's you know let us know what what's keeping you up at night <laughs> <laughs> climate change yeah <laughs> but in terms of like in a good way what's keeping you up in terms of like Sorry. i'm excited yeah I'm, I'm excited to work on this next project yeah well i'm i'm, I'm aware of all, all the you know possible um and the other research which is you know there to do in in the field i mean and i'm very very interested in history of translation but i also feel that it's now Certainly, in my case, you know, the uh, younger generation can also take over, and there's still a lot mm -hmm. to do on the on the Arabic uh, uh, tradition. Maybe you know, mm -hmm. let's take up, you know, starting from the uh, from the Nahda onwards. Um, mm -hmm. uh, personally, my my current current interest, you know, I'm very interested in um, animal rights and animal welfare, and very interested in how translation and language are playing a role there so um oh. that's what i'm currently working on wow and is that between which languages or just in general you're working from a number of well, languages the languages i know which are what arabic french and french. english and english you know looking at what, what's and it's quite, quite interesting and it, it can have you know links to the medieval period as well because there were quite a few treat um re, well, discussions in, in Arabic in terms of animal welfare, wow. veterinary practice in the 9th, 10th centuries and uh, issues that were discussed, discussed. Uh, yeah, so that's quite, uh, you know, either as an, an, in a kind of religious setting, right? Uh, a, a tradition of caring and compassion, um, wow. which I'm, you know, very interested in delving into. Yeah, I mean, I definitely we, we would. I look forward to hopefully having the opportunity to have a roundtable about that. Um, something that I really mm -hmm. just have not even thought about the connections between animal welfare and, and translation. And um, Thotik, what what are you working on or looking towards? Uh, working just, on? What we've just been talking about. I'm quite interested in the question of transition and creativity and. Uh, 
and what these kind of this history in Arabic and probably other languages can teach us, teach us about uh, uh, translators. I mean, translation as a very creative uh, act and um, in the way it could contribute to understanding, to creating a new trends, a new, you know, um, literary works and also understanding even the literary works themselves and the original ones through translation. So I'm very much interested in this issue now. Yeah. That's my current, yeah. It's your kind focus. Okay. Well, it's, you know, two minutes to the end of time. I just like to take this moment to thank all of the attendees, uh, you know, for, for staying with us for, for the entire session and for your, you know, very um, just, probing good questions you know I feel like we got uh, so much out of Miriam and thought he must be exhausted um, after our, our, our conversation but I've just been so honored to to be here and to be able to discuss and celebrate this anthology with you as I said in the beginning it is really groundbreaking I'm not just saying that I went in with no sort of you know preconceptions and came out of it just like wow how this is really something that we all need to get uh, a copy of, and uh, I'd like to hand over to Duncan. Yes. Thank you, Savad. Thank you all. What a feast. Um, uh, just uh, uh, three things from me just to uh, to close. Uh, firstly, I, I popped a link in the chat uh, through to the uh, homepage for the anthology at Routledge. If you haven't uh, seen the anthology so far, then further details uh, on the Routledge website. Um, this was our last regular research seminar of the academic year at the CLT, but uh, we have a, an important uh, uh, further event coming up in a couple of weeks time, and that's our Zebalt lecture, uh, and that's given this year by uh, Lydia Davis, and uh, that will be in uh, just uh, precisely two weeks time uh, on Wednesday, the 1st of June, and at the same time, 4 p.m., here in the UK. So do uh, head over to the uh, British Library uh, uh, website to uh, book that. Hope you can join us. Um, and uh, finally then, uh, just to say thank you so much uh, once again to all of you, to uh, Tarek and to uh, Miriam for a wonderful discussion. I've learned so much uh, this afternoon. And thank you, Savad, for your ex expert chairing as well. Thank you, everybody, and uh, hope to see you again soon.